Welcome everyone to the Santa Fe Independent Film Festival's 2020 Documentors Panel, moderated by award-winning documentor and Taos-based filmmaker, Lynn Hamrick. We will be joined today by Paul Sima of My Dear Mother, Pete Marimi of I Am Samuel, Maya Leku and Chris King of The Letter, and Lisa Imordino Vreeland of Truman in Tennessee, An Intimate Conversation. Okay. I'm very excited to have these wonderful filmmakers here. Um, I've obviously watched all the films and they are compelling and beautifully crafted. And they all capture their subjects in the most intimate way. So my first question, I'll start with Lisa. How do you choose your subjects? Do they choose you? Um, and talk to me about that. Sure. Um, I, well, it's interesting. Do they choose me? I think we choose each other at times because, um, you know, what happens in the, I'm not sure if you're familiar with some of my other films, but I've really been, it's like the 20th century is, and the creative forces of the 20th century seem to be my, my topic, you know, from Deanna Freeland to Peggy Guggenheim to Cecil Beaton to Truman Capote and Tennessee Williams. And Truman, Capote actually started as a Truman Capote film and because another film came out, it morphed into Truman in Tennessee, which became much, much more interesting and um, a path that became, um, for me as a filmmaker, it, it opened up a lot of different doors uh, creatively. And, um, and I do think I, it's something about these personalities that really provoke a need in me to not only learn more about them, but want to retell their stories for another, for another generation, really. And, and so it's, it's really both, both ways, because I feel like I'm very much part of them by the end of the process. So if that answers it. Yeah, I I'd love to more, hear. About. I have some more questions about that. But um, Maya, how do you choose your subjects or do they choose you? Uh, I think a bit of both. I think for the, for the letter, um, it was a little bit of a windy road and then we finally found each other. Um, and it was actually just by coincidence um, because Chris and I had, had started making a film about, I'm not going to get too deep into it, but about a female Kenyan freedom fighter. And as we were kind of having a lot of interviews with a lot of elders, there's a specific language, like we both speak Kiswahili, but there was a specific language from this part of the coast, um, which we couldn't speak. And so we then, um, try to find a translator to help us with some of that footage, some of the footage of the interviews with the elders. And we met our main protagonist now, Carissa, um, who then as he was watching the footage of the elders kind of going through this very kind of traumatic, um, you know, accusations, um, he was like, oh my gosh, this is happening to my grandma right now. And for us, it was really that kind of moment where we were like, wow, you know, because we've been having a lot of kind of interviews and stories of what had happened in the past, but we hadn't quite found our thing yet in terms of this very intimate uh, emotional story that we were looking for. Um, so that's how it kind of came, it came to us, I suppose. And it, we, yeah, yeah. So during the process of filming, did you always have to have a translator or no? No, no, no. Because most people, most people in the country speak Kiswahili. Right. Um, some of these very, very interior parts where you went, like in the letter, there's, you know, one scene with the elders at the shelter and a lot of them don't speak Swahili. They only speak Kigiriyama, which is from this area. And that's a language that I, that I don't speak. We don't, Chris and I both don't speak. Um, so it's for those things that we have to kind of get translations. Uh, there's something that I read that said you weren't, that you're born in Kenya, right? But that you right. had really been part of that coastal community and that that was a whole learning experience for you or something. Can you speak to that, please? Yeah. Um, I was born in Nairobi, born and bred. And, um, and my father left when I was very young. Um, and my mom's German Italian. So she really brought me up in the city. Um, and I was kind of a bit of an urbanite. Um, at the same time, then my father comes from a village well, he comes from two places. One is the coastal town of Mombasa, where, his, where he was born. But then there's an area which is like in real kind of country land, as we say, um, where my grandmother came from, from his side of the family. And funnily enough, like where Carissa's uh, grandmother lives, which is where we were filming for those four years, is right across the road from where my 
my uncles live. So, right. so yeah, so where my, where my grandmother's um, nephews live. So, um, so it, was, it was a bit of a coincidence. Paul, thanks for joining us. How do you choose your subjects or do they choose you? I mean, with Dasha and Alona, you have these amazing uh, young women and you follow them over a, a many years. So talk to, how did you choose them? Basically, <laughs> I, I think that uh, they are choosing me. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, uh, the story about Dasha, uh, the reason I found her was that I made a film earlier about a woman who had uh, grown up at that orphanage. And uh, while we were ending this film, uh, we wanted to shoot a scene uh, where she goes back to her own orphanage and meets all the people she has been talking about. But on the step to the orphanage, she refused to, 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 to do the filming because she was so afraid when she saw this orphanage. So we decided that we will go into the orphanage anyway. And, and, and there we met this girl who, the first thing, thing she said uh, was that, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a girl. I, I thought that I have no mother, but now I have two mothers because my mother, someone called on, on the telephone and, and said that it's my mother. But I don't believe it's my mother. It's someone who is uh, uh, coming here and trying to kidnap me. <laughs> and and uh, and and she uh, she was very open and and, and she uh, we were we were just filming her, and and we don't we didn't need, know what was like happening. And and I'm also a. Uh, I, I don't speak, I, I, I understand about 50% in Russian. My, my mother tongue is Sami, who, uh, that is also spoken in Russia. So I can, I can like understand when the indigenous peoples speak with each other. But when they start to speak Russian, then I'm a little bit like uh, after uh, as, as a di director, but, but she told a lot of things. And, 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 and actually we shot like one day and, and, and then when we left, we said that, oh, we, we will have to trash this material because it's, what are we going to do with this? It's, it's, it's one girl that we have shot only one day and, and, and it's hopeless. What, 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 what happened? <laughs> and then we went back and, and, and someone translated this uh, interviews and they said, hey, what is this? It doesn't fit to this film, but but this is an interesting person. That, like, what is this story? And 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 and, and uh, then I followed her. Like, I followed her uh, seven years, uh, and and I, I met her like uh, perhaps uh, five six days a year, and just like I was curious because I I was I was in the beginning I I really thought also that this woman uh, who had been contacting her that that she was a criminal who wanted to <laughs> to, 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 because in Russia you can like, if you get the kid, you, you get a lot of economical benefits. You can get access to an apartment. You can, you can, you can, you can use a kid in many ways to, to, for your own benefit. But, uh, we understood that that uh, after a while that this was really her uh, real mother who had been like returning and and, and trying to to get uh, contact with her daughter again and, and and she wanted her to come back but and and and, and uh, yeah that the time in this film is very long we followed her for for very long time and and she grew from a little girl to a teenager and and she also got more and more like um, as a teenager, uh, she she get she got more and more like uh, critical against her mother and her parents, and she was like rebelling against her parents, even if she had not been living with them. And and um, and and uh, yes, basically we followed her from 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 childhood to, to, to when she found her first boyfriend and, 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 and when she was released from this, uh, this, this orphanage. And, and 
the only reason why that happened was that she chose us, that she right. like needed someone who, who uh, like someone to tell the story, that she, in some way she, she had faith in us. And, and even if we were, we were like foreigners <laughs> and we were like uh, not Russians, she, she opened, uh, she decided as, as a little kid that she, that, that she wanted to tell this story to us. And, and she also sent a lot of letters and kept contact with us. And, and, and she was asking, when are you coming back? And I have more to tell. And, 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 and then, then we like, um, and it, it took a very long time for, for me to understand what, what this story was about. <laughs> right. and, and even in the editing, we were wondering because there are so many things in, in the history of, of, of the indigenous peoples of Russia that are hard to understand. And it's, it's, it's hard to, 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 to tell in a movie because a movie is a lot about feelings, about experiences, and, and it's, it's not a book. <laughs> right. And Pete, how do you choose, and you have a huge background as a wonderful j journalist and, and freelance uh, cinematographer and news journalist, but how do you choose your subjects and, and or do they choose you and specifically in I Am Samuel? Um, I could say we find each other, like there is, it's not like, um, I deliver, I choose or they choose me. It is sort of happens. We, the right energy and it happens that we want the same thing out of the, whatever goals we have. And then it just works. Like for example, with I Am Samuel, um, I was really keen to, to tell a story about what it is like to be a gay man um, in Kenya. And what I wanted is, because majority of, of Kenyans come from the poorer side, and before we'd seen how the more affluent uh, gay people uh, have told their story, but it was really hard to find how a poor gay man lives. So when I met Samuel and I told him like, this is what I want to do. And he just said, I've always wanted people to see what happens. And it was like, not just for me, because when I was a teenager, I really wanted to know that uh, I was not alone. And we had like a, similar goals and it worked together perfectly. What were the challenges for you in, in trying to capture what you did so beautifully, so many intimate situations? Um, two things. First was security. In Because um, as you know, uh, in Kenya, uh, if you're gay, it's risky, especially with the public find out, uh, besides it being illegal. So it was very important like during the filming that uh, the community do not know exactly why I'm filming the people I'm filming with. Uh, but also the other thing which basically took time was for Samuel and his friends to completely understand where I was coming from and what I wanted to do and to trust me with their story as a custodian to to, to tell what's happening in them. So to gain that trust took time. That uh, took over five years of filming. So those are the two most challenging components. You shot the film? Yeah, I did. So can you talk about that as it being a director shooter? Uh, I think there's two things. It was a strength, but also those some negatives. So I'll start with the positive news about it because I was the only uh, person, the crew, I was shooting and doing the sound and everything. It was much more easier for me to, to blend in and much more easier for me to connect with the people that I'm filming. So that was the plus. Uh, but the disadvantage was the technical issues. Uh, sound was a big problem. Like you have six people in a room and it's just you. Like it was really hard to figure out where to be in the right place to get everything. So technically it was really hard, but it was a price worth paying for the intimacy. So Lisa, getting back to you, and we're talking about sort of the serendipity of film, how you start out with one idea, and as you did, maybe just on, on Truman, and then you 
morphed in with, with um, Tennessee, or did I hear that right? You did. No, 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 you did. It was actually, it was one of, it was a producer. It was one of my producers who said, you know, why don't we add a uh, Tennessee Williams into the mix? And, and when we did, it just opened, you know, I knew that they were friends and I knew that, you know, they were, their worlds were just, you know, they were merged in these, in these funny ways. And, and the fact is they were friends, they were frenemies, they were never lovers. Okay. Um, but there were a lot of commonalities in their life. You know, they both had the, this desire to, to write at a very, very young age. Uh, they both were gay. Uh, they both came from broken homes. Uh, they both were addicts because each one had a parent who was an addict and who's an alcoholic. Um, they both suffered from depression and they both suffered also from being at the top of their game and then the game crashing down and then trying to scramble up. And, um, and you know, what we did was that we really drew parallels of their creative process, because for me, ultimately, it's very much about their creative process and about their inner life that we were able to, uh, what we were able to do with this film, because it's not a biopic in any way. And since you've seen it, you, you understand, but we really are able to, in, in, in a very, um, you know, in, in a very kind of different way, we were able to have them talk about the same things. And even though they were maybe not together at that time, we're able to create that feeling in the film. And, and there were moments that they were together and they lived, you know, this expat life as well in Europe. And they would hang out if they went to Morocco and they went to Tangier, they both would be with Paul Bowles and Jane, Paul and, and Jane Bowles. And they had the same friends when they were in Paris, they had the same friends in London, but they may not have been there at the same time, but it was still a very similar life. And, um, and it really, it just added a completely different spin to the story with Tennessee. And, um, and it's, you really see a side of both of these. I mean, we haven't seen much of Tennessee, by the way, anyway. You know, I don't think anybody has done something as a feature doc in a long time. So this was really, you know, we get to know him, I think, in a very different way. And we see a different side of Truman because I think the Truman that we've all been seeing out there is, is a Truman post in cold blood. Part, it's a party of the year. It's just kind of his decline. He's drunk. He's not, it's all about answered prayers. And that did, that's not what inspired me about him. I wanted to hear these men's words. I mean, these words, they're inspiring words that were important for us and that we really felt we brought, were able to bring out in the film. So let's get into some of the technical aspects of filmmaking because you both have, have done something so masterfully. Um, you as a composer and a musician, Maya, and your score is beautiful. Um, and, and Chris is a DP, is that, he's been a DP also, is that correct? Yes. And yes. This, and this was and your first, oh, here you are, Chris, perfect time. Hi, sorry. You came right on time. Sorry. So I was talking about um, how you, this is your directorial feature, although both of you have made and been involved in many creative projects and you're a composer and you've been also director of photography. How is it working as a team? How is it coming and doing your first directorial feature? And also I noticed that you have an editor who's also the editor of the letter, uh, right? I oh, mean, I'm okay. Samuel, you're the, yeah, right, you're the letter. And then there's, I'm Samuel, Richard Acosta, is that correct? So- Ricardo, Ricardo Acosta. Ricardo, yeah. sorry. So go, talk to me about all, I don't know if you can pick one of those things, but but pick one of them. <laughs> All right. And you want to go? Or? You get through. Okay. Um, so 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 it's funny, you know, because I think already like our our worlds as husband and wife and filmmakers and musicians have always kind of been doing this, um, and and this was the first project where we decided to really kind of come together and work on a film together, and. I think it's funny because when, when you talk to people, because we're co both co-directing, both co-producing, both trying to kind of do everything essentially, but yes, there is a kind of a certain divide between uh, Chris, cinematographer, um, and myself um, doing kind of sound and the composing stuff, but essentially like everything's kind of mixed. So 
you know, it's, it's sometimes when you're in a relationship and you're like, okay, you know that you just need to do this and this person just needs to do that. Um, and we essentially then don't have that. And that can cause, that can cause many hurdles, but it also works so beautifully on so many other levels. Um, and I, I guess before that, uh, like with Maya's music, I, I was always kind of a bit behind the scenes. So I guess we were collaborating. Yeah. I would help like produce the albums or design the artwork or... We carried many speakers. I would, I, I've carried a lot of heavy speakers in my time. <laughs> Um, even uh, managing the band when they would be on tour and jumping in there and then when it came to kind of music videos Maya would get involved with directing or producing or making sure everyone's fed as well as being in front of the camera mm. um, and organizing that so and and because the beginnings of the letter was was such a personal I guess um, there's a lot of intention to learn a lot about Maya's kind of coastal roots oh so you've already spoken yeah. about that um, it kind of felt like something you know we got married during the course of the of the filming oh wow um, wow uh, yeah so I'm glad um, it was at the beginning of the course no I'm joking <laughs> and um and so, yeah, it's, it, 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 it's always just kind of being blurred. But I think coming into the space as, as you know, being a family ourselves, um, I think brought a lot to how we're able to get the kind of access we got. Mm. Um, and, and just how we come into a space was, was, very, was very tied into us kind of being husband and wife. And this was a five year or six year process? Six year process. Six years, and did yeah. you workshop oh. it at the Sundance Lab or was that another film? Did, did you workshop the film? It um, yeah, well, we workshopped it at It for Bertha yeah. um, and Hot Dogs Blue Eyes, because uh, we were part of both of those. Um, and I think that's essentially, and DocuBox, which is, a, which is an East African documentary fund. And actually that's where our, our whole journey began. Um, together with Pete, actually, from I Am Summer, we were all in the same cohort. Um, so it's great kind of seeing all these films kind of coming up at the same time. Um, yeah, so those were the two. Can you talk about workshopping a film and what that means for, for filmmakers and audiences who may not be familiar with how long it takes to get a film from the concept to the finished line? Yes, that is a long process. Um, I don't know about you, Lisa, but like uh, for us, and maybe it's also because this was our first film, as I mentioned, you know, we kind of initially started on this journey of this freedom fighter, uh, and that's what we were going with. And as we were then speaking to a lot of mentors, they were like, you know, this is great, but also like historically, you know, are you going to tell a historical documentary? We're like, no. So we couldn't actually quite quite find our path for a while. Um, and, and I think also going into these workshops, um, it's so amazing how much material and how much kind of advice you come out with. At the same time, I think, and if, if you're new in the game, you're also just taking it all on and then being like, you know, swaying left, right, and center. Um, so I think now as, as, as second time filmmakers, uh, feature filmmakers, um, it's, it's now in that space where how do you know, how do you learn how to take on things? Um, and then also for the things that you really kind of stand against or that you really don't want, you know, it to be part of, of the story or, or your process, then then you know how to let that go. And I think Chris and I essentially took everything on and we were just trying to do everything that everyone had said. And we were kind of getting more, you know, like making, we call it here ugali, which is like maize, which is solid maize um, after you cook it with hot water. And it was like that. But, uh, I mean, what was, I mean, the film was really born in a, in, in a workshop um, yeah. back in 2013. Um, DocuBox, which is the kind of first ever East African film fund um, kind of launched with their first, um, with the first cohort. I am Samuel was in there. We were in there along with six other projects. Um, so it gave us, um, I guess, before then, there hadn't been a lot of cohesion between filmmakers. We kind of worked here in the industry for... It would then would have been about eight years and without a kind of established infrastructure um, for filmmakers um, in Kenya, uh, you found that everyone was just working in their own silos and there, there was not a lot of kind of cross pollination and, and, and collaboration. Um, so for the first time, um, Judy Kibinge, the founder of DocuBox, um, kind of brought together all these filmmakers with some mentors from the US, from the UK and from Kenya. Um, and I guess for the first time we were with our kind of, with other filmmakers seeing the struggles they were going through, mm -hmm. seeing Pete's um, footage from I Am Samuel, um, the first scenes that he, that he assembled kind of 
I, I would say really, really affected how, how we even looked at our project um, and, and seeing the kind of sensitivity and access um, that, that he had kind of, I don't know, it's, it's kind of healthy competition, but also like, like inspiration, yeah. um, just getting inspired. I picked that up with the letter and I'm Samuel, that there was this, you know, co mm, energy around it. Um, Lisa, you amaze me with your body of work and, and your ability to use graphics and design and, um, how, and how you go to archival footage. And you also do your films in, in con at the same time with books. Can you talk about that, please? And your, oh. your sense of design. Sure. sure. <laughs> nice to meet you, Chris, by the way. Nice to meet you. <laughs> um, you know, I, I guess, um, you know, I don't, first of all, you know, I don't do books with all of the films. It, it really depends. And um, I didn't do anything with Truman in Tennessee because frankly, there's no reason for me to say, I think they express their own words uh, best. But, you know, I, I do feel in the, in the documentary world that things can really look beautiful really really beautiful and I think and I do find that you know I've I've grown up with a passion for photography and art and you know I grew up in Europe I have I have a certain sensibility I know exactly what I like I love archives um, and I have a team who also really loves archives and it's I always try to have some kind of surprise and archival surprise and in, in all of the films. And, and I, I really only get that because people believe in me and the team. And that's the only reason because they know that we're going to treat the material. Well, you know, we also, even in the back of our films, our credits are these, it's literally an encyclopedia and somebody would had just seen the Truman film and they they're like, my gosh, because you know, cause I, I had, I didn't go to the Harry Ransom center, but I, I had two proxy researchers who did a fabulous job. You know, I went up to Harvard to the Houghton library. And, um, and of course I was at the New York public library for Truman, but it's, it's about all of these really wonderful discoveries and, you know, aesthetically, I mean, these should be cinematic, these films and, um, and, you know, I feel that just because we're doing a documentary, that doesn't mean that it should be in any, you know, aesthetically, it should be at the level of the best that we could possibly get out there. And, um, and you know, kind of going back to what, what Maya was talking and both Maya and Chris were talking about kind of, you know, funding and things like that. You know, I, I went through that whole part of my, I, I've done four feature films, four feature docs, and, you know, I can, attest to the fact that I did apply for grants. I got, I think I did receive it. In fact, we thought it was a mistake when we received it. We read the email five times because we're like, oh no, no, there's no way we could have actually received a New York State Council of the Arts. You know, it wasn't huge, but we were so grateful. And it was also, it was the right project because it was Peggy Guggenheim Art Addict. Um, but it's difficult every time for me for funding, every single time. And, um, and I don't apply for grants anymore. I just, I've reached the point that I, I just want to get the film done and I, and, and I just make it happen. And we don't, you know, it's, we really not, we know how to work very efficiently at this point. And I also do a lot of commercial work on the side. So I do, um, and that keeps me, that keeps the whole team busy and that really funds a lot of these other projects. But funding still is just impossible. And, and I think also, especially for the films I make, which are based around arts, culture, um, fashion, it's not if people aren't gonna give money for that. It's just, it's much more, it's, that's not where the, the world is going, unfortunately. Um, I wanna ask you, we, we talked about casting the subjects and how, you, how one is drawn to a particular, material, but I want to know how you cast actors to be the voices of the real people and who would often be edited even very closely to the real people talking, to Truman talking and Tennessee talking. So mm -hmm. how do you do that? And how did yeah, well, you direct them? It's always, it's always really kind of a dream to, you know, you think, oh, well, wouldn't it be great, you know, to be able to cast this person. And so I've used voiceover now several times in Love, Cecil. It was really clear to me that it should have, that it should have been Rupert Everett. 
And, you know, it may be clear to me, it may not be clear to him. Okay. That's not always a given. And, but actually it was, he really wanted to do it. So it was great. And, you know, and I, I think that, you know, when you're doing a voiceover, everybody just kind of has to be relaxed and it should be a fun process. I mean, all of this, we all work so hard. We want this to be a fun process. And I think with Rupert, I worked for two hours and he got it. I mean, you know, you have to kind of let actors do what they want a little bit. And then, you know, you, you get into a rhythm and then you just start to say, you know, you need to do this, you need to do that. But you just, you know, these guys are, they're pros. I mean, that, that's the real thing. It's, you know, I was lucky I worked with uh, Timothy Chalmay. He, he was, he played a, a young Jean Cocteau for this short film that I did. And he was great in it. And I wanted him to speak French. I wanted him to speak English, but I wanted him to speak French. And he just kind of had that energy that was, that was right for it. And, you know, in, in the case of Truman in Tennessee, Jim Parsons is Truman and uh, Zach Quinto is Tennessee Williams. And they were the most perfect fit because you really needed to have, like initially I felt that they had to be two actors who really understood this world of this, of the theater world, of the writing world. And there were two actors who were friends and they also happened to be gay. Um, and I loved, I loved that. And it just, and it just happened. And they both were so really generous. I mean, that's all I can say, generous with their time. And you know, this doesn't, it takes usually just a couple of hours to do these sessions. We had a couple of sessions just on the, we had Zooms. But, you know, they know what they wanted to do. What was really important with Truman and with Jim doing Truman, because I just, I have this kind of, this feeling of always hearing Truman and he's just too high pitched. And it's always about this kind of feeling of the end of his life. And, and I just said to Jim, I said, give him gravitas. I said, that's what we want. We want some gravitas here. And that's exactly what he did. Yeah. Right. And Zach, Zach was great. Zach's like, you know what? Yeah. I want to do this lazy, like this lazy, like kind of dropping a vowel. He had it. He, he, he had it completely from the beginning. Yeah. Very, very well done. So, um, you know, it's now that iPhones are so ubiquitous, um, I think in both the letter and um, I am Samuel, was there footage that the subjects themselves shot on iPhones included in the films or no? Um, um, not from our end. The, the only part was where, where Carissa was reading some of the Facebook posts that were put on his phone, but there was no, no actual footage of him filming with that, with a phone. And, and, in, in so, Samuel, go ahead. There is a uh, phone footage of uh, violence uh, against right. uh, one of Samuel's friends being beaten, but that right. is actually filmed by the perpetrators who distributed it on the WhatsApp groups. So okay. there is some phone footage, but that is um, that we used in the film. Okay, Keith, did you work with the Impact producer? We are working with an impact producer now. Can you talk about that? Because I still want to know how to work. What is an impact producer and can I get one? <laughs> uh, so because especially we think the film that we're working on, it is really important that we get it to be seen back home in Kenya, but also in a way that is constructive and has the biggest impact. So um, partly because I'm a street Kenyan man, and this film is about a queer man in Kenya, we thought it was really important, first of all, to, to get someone who's from the community who can easily get this film uh, distributed easily and who knows all the stakeholders. But also it was really important to, to think through all the stages like, what is the best time and way to release it mm -hmm. so that it can have the maximum mm -hmm. impact uh, that can, I know like we always say like we want to change the world and change, but just basically can start moving the needle in a direction that it should. So we had a workshop, I think over every weekend for a month, uh, brainstorming, 
Um, and we've, we have now an impact plan that we hope to implement soon next year. Mm -hmm. um, so Maya and Chris, I have a question for you more technically about working with an editor and maybe even giving an editor a writing credit or how do you, how, because uh, Ricardo worked on both of the films, uh, your film, The Letter, and I Am Samuel. But talk about that process a, a bit for us, please. Yes, yeah, so what was great about meeting Ricardo was he was our mentor, one of our mentors at Hot Dogs Blue Ice Lab. And, um, and Ricardo is from Cuba originally, but lived in, has lived in Canada for many years. And I think with this particular film, because it's so sensitive with its topic of talking about um, witchcraft um, and these elders being accused of witchcraft, it was really interesting kind of speaking to a lot of European editors um, and their approach on how they look at witchcraft as opposed to a Cuban editor or an African editor um, who understands the spirituality and who understands the background of it, of witchcraft. Um, so that was really interesting for us. And as soon as we met him, um, you know, and started speaking to him, we knew that he was just the right person for the job. Um, and do you want to add? I mean, we'd, we'd um, I mean, I, my first few years in Kenya working in the industry, I worked as an editor, um, but I never cut a feature documentary before, yeah. and let alone your own footage. Um, so we, we kind of edited ourselves in circles for like two years. Um, I mean, we knew we, we knew we had something and, and we knew at least we had that climactic scene at the end, but we just couldn't get the empathy like properly grounded and we just couldn't make it play. Um, so having someone like Ricardo who, who has such, um, such experience and such a kind of poetic and cinematic sensibility, um, we managed to find support and kind of brought him to Nairobi and just like, I mean, it was, it was pretty horrifying. Um, just like those first few days, like the shift that, that we made, but, um, seeing just how he just kind of started with the first shot and then the second shot and we cut the film from there and feeling his intuition and under, like starting to understand why that worked and why what we tried didn't work. We, you know, he went back to Canada. We worked on the cut a bit more. We, we broke some of the things that he'd done. Yeah, and, Chris did a bunch of editing here um, too. And then found out why what we tried to change didn't work. And, and the symbiosis was really amazing, kind of all of us. I mean, Maya edited um, even even portions. Um, you know, we'd be on three, three, three stations at a time. Um, so w working with, with, with someone like that, I think was a huge blessing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's just taught us so much that, that we'll carry on to our next films. And, um, you know, he's, he's working with us on our next film already. And, and that's already just kind of, uh, yeah, exciting. Just to, to send him footage or, or to send him something we've worked on and we're, we're always just excited to... To hear his feedback. To, 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 to hear back. Yeah, and we were like also really happy to introduce um, Ricardo to Pete uh, for okay. I Am Sam. Okay, yeah. yeah. I wanted to follow up with Maya, who, who is a musician and a composer and, and talk about music and uh, go ahead, Maya. Um, but no, as a composer, so so before I, I got into this film world with this particular film um, as my first feature film, uh, I was a musician pretty much full time um, and still a touring musician, etc. And I'd never actually written a score for a film. Um, and I actually, at the beginning of this process, I remember like sitting, Ricardo had come out from Canada and we were sitting there and between Chris and Ricardo, they're like, you know, I think you should try and write something. And I was like, absolutely no way. I'd been, tr I'd been suggesting this for four years at you this had, point. You had, you um, had. But it just, it just, I just, I just felt it wasn't my place. Um, and I also think kind of as a kind of director producer, like, I, I don't know, I just, it felt weird. Um, so, so, but in, all this while in the last six years, like learning so much like rich cultural music um, and, and, and my heritage and history, musical history from this area has been absolutely incredible. Um, so I've been absorbing it, but essentially like wanting to put it in the film that never was the, never was the case. And so then as these guys were editing one day and I had a little bit of time, I was like, okay, well, let me try and write something. And that's how then that journey began. Um, and the first song in the film is a Lullaby 
which is actually sung at a much lower uh, um, key and much faster. And for me, I was really just trying to experiment if I just sang it kind of very high a cappella, um, and I just added a couple of like backward sounds of my voice um, on, a, on a MIDI keyboard, um, you know, just experimenting with that. And it, and it fit beautifully. And I think like essentially like the, the very few parts where my voice does play a role in the film is kind of acting as like a like a, a guardian or a spiritual guide mm -hmm. for grandma and the other elders in the film. Um, and, and I was working together with, because this is my first time, together with a, a Canadian composer called Ken Meir. Um, and together, it was actually a really beautiful synergy um, as to me composing pretty much a lot of the things on guitar and vocals, and then us then working through that and figuring out, okay, should we take the guitar out? Um, I experimented with putting like paper in the guitar for having that more traditional sound during the kind of elderly shelter scene. Um, so yeah. So first time, but I'm excited to really do this more. I get, yeah. I mean, this is you, and your voice is incredible. And I think it really, really is wonderful in the film. Um, uh, and Lisa, can you talk about how you work with music with your foot? Because you also, with the archival footage and the interviews and the way you go in and out, it, it's seamless. Well, first of all, I cannot wait to, to, to see both of the films. And I really, I'm, I'm totally impressed that you composed the music and sung as well. So I can't wait to, to watch that, Maya. Um, you know, I've been working with composers lately because I just find it's, um, you know, I, I work with this amazing composer called uh, Michele D'Amato, but his composing name is Madi. And he's in Italy and he was in complete lockdown during the time, complete lockdown. And he, and we just have, we've been working together for about two years and it was just an incredible process. He was going through a personal like, health issue, not COVID related, okay? <laughs> but he was going through a health issue during the time and the film brought him through the whole pro the, his, his health issue. And it was really inspiring for him. And it was just such a pleasure. And we would literally get on WhatsApp and, um, and it's, you know, I really wanted to have a European sound, the, the, mm -hmm. the film. And, and Michele has a real, um, he was really trained on the classics. And, um, and he just, he had a very distinct point of view. When, sometimes we had to talk him down off of his perch with, with a couple of songs, but rarely. I mean, he was, it was really instinctual with him. And, you know, and I, I believe, you know, there I've been working with a lot of the same people for many years. I mean, my little kind of short span of being a, a filmmaker. And I, I really feel it's important to let people do what they do best. And, uh, and you know, if I work with a composer, I respect their idea. If I feel it's just not right, I said, let's just hold on to it. Let's just put that there. Let's just put it aside for now. But it's the same thing with, you know, with the, with the editor, Bernadine Kolish, who have, this is my third film with her, um, you know, with the producers, uh, with the DP, um, you know, it's, it, this is, I mean, I think we're, we're lucky. I mean, this is what it's, it's teamwork. It's not, it's about the support that is around. Um, it's cause it's certainly not just me. So I think, um, we're probably going to wind it up in a minute, but I, I think it's so, um, encouraging for filmmakers and audiences to understand how long it takes to make films, how, um, how the process is as involved and collaborative and yet so many serendipity and surprises and things that, that come to bear. Um, and I like to think about themes and I was just so moved by all of these films and I hope that all the people who are supporting the Santa Fe Independent Film Festival will really watch these films because they're just wonderful. And yes, you know, we're doing it virtually and yes, you're gonna watch it, but bring people to your house and, and watch these films and talk about them afterwards and, and give feedback to the filmmakers and recommend the films to your friends. But, but I felt a theme with all of these films and I could be totally off base, but I'd like each of you to maybe see if this fits or not. But I felt all of the films had something to do with forgiveness and were, were love stories as well. Um, Lisa, does that resonate with you or can you just speak to that a, a bit? 
No, I think, um, you know, I, I was thinking of kind of the, the impact of, not the film, the impact that both Truman and Tennessee had. And um, I think, you know, there's something about Truman, about celebrity and stardom that he was, you know, in touch with that and in tune with that before it became part of, unfortunately, our every day. And, but with, and that, that, that's fine. Really what interests me was Tennessee because Tennessee talked about emotions. He made it okay to talk about how you felt and if it was good at the ups and the downs. And um, because he did that through his work and through, and through, his, through his plays. And so, you know, I think it's about emotions, authenticity. Those are kind of the, the touch tones for me that I feel were in, important. I wish I, I now I, I hope I get to, I'm going to have to now buy my little virtual pass to watch all of your other, your films. But did, you um, feel there, did you feel that at least I got this from the film that, the, that artists go through these phases of being very close with one another and then falling out and then coming completely. back together. So was there that sense of forgiveness that they kind of reconciled it? Well, I think so. I mean, listen, yeah. there's, there's a letter, there's a letter very much that, I mean, we quote at the very end of the film that Truman, I mean, Tennessee wrote to Truman and he forgives him. And he goes, you know, remember, just laugh, you know? And, and the fact is, is that, you know, through, through it all, because of course it was typically Truman who was throwing the punches at Tennessee. And there, there was a forgiveness. And, um, and I think that, you know, it's a time to kind of think about that right now. And all of us in our isolation throughout different places in the world. Um, but no, 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 very, very much so. And um, I also really and thoughtfulness. And thoughtfulness. I, right, and I really appreciated with you and um, with I am Samuel, Samuel, the ability to go in and really talk about sexuality. I liked how there, the, that really, you got into that in the film in a way that I, I felt was um, unique and, and vital. Um, right. Maya and Chris, what about, what do you feel thematically? Is there something you want to um, emphasize? Um, I don't know, I would, like, it's interesting that you say forgiveness um, because I feel like throughout the journey of the film, the relationship between grandma and her grandson, there's a lot of affection, there's a lot of love. But at the same time, actually, I don't know if, I don't know if forgiveness, because then she's been accused of practicing witchcraft by her stepson, the grandma. Um, but not at any point, actually, do I feel that there is like a sense of forgiveness. And I don't want to say too much, people who haven't watched yeah, the Yeah, no yet. spoilers. <laughs> no, no spoilers. Um, but I would, I, 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 I would, um, I would agree with you. I, right. I, I, yeah, I think that there's a lot of forgiving going on. Like that surprised me that 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 someone could accuse you of such kind of uh, vilifying things. And and Grandma really is forgiving to um, all these people, which really feels like a testament to to just like the power of 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 the institution of family, mm -hmm. as far as in the kind of rural Kenyan context. Um, and for me, I, I mean, if, if something like this was to happen um, back home where I came from, there would be no even discussing it, let alone um, asking someone to come and sit tea and let's talk through it. Um, I found uh, it really brought out like the patience and the, yeah, and the, and, and the forgiving nature, um, I think, of what we, were, what, what we were witnessing. And Pete? Pete, hello. Pete. <laughs> oh, there. Oh, well, okay. Wait, we, you came back to us, Paul. We'll go to you, Paul. Forgiveness. Yes, yes Paul, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, in, in, in my film, I think it's true because it, it's, you know, in a way, they are struggling to forgive people who don't uh, deserve to be forgiven, <laughs> in a way, because it's, they they are like these are kids who who grow up with the mothers and, and fathers who had who have lived the life that have made the kids sick they are when they were born they they were basically drug addicts and they were alcoholists and they have kind all kind of sicknesses and and during this uh, when they grow up they are also like going through different kinds of 
medical treatments to 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 be healed from 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 the heritage of of, of their biological fa uh, fathers and mothers and, and 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 they are struggling very much to forgive them and and and, and basically the mothers they don't want to have to, anything to do with these girls so, so it in a way it's it's if this is from my point of view i don't know as a viewer if, if if you see it but it's in a way they are forgiving and and really asking for forgiveness uh, they are almost talking for their parents instead of themselves so it's uh, so it's 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 their struggle but i i i think for example the second person in my film this um, uh, uh, Dasha's best friend. Her her parents. They never answered any any letters. They they never wanted to have anything to do with her. When she took contact with them, they they didn't even want to meet and and and, and talk with her. And over and over and over, she like took contact and asked them for for a meeting. But this basically never happened. So so it, it's it's a kind of. Um, of 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 following people who are like during their childhood and ten year they are asking for for forgiveness and and also to 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 have some kind of uh, uh, contact with their parents but but their parents they live in such a state so they don't uh, basically they they are almost danger dangerous for for these kids they, they, as one of the girls says that if if her mother had a chance she would sell her for a bottle of of vodka so it's 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 uh, so so the forgiving is it's it's uh, i don't know if if it has something to do with this uh, russian orthodox religion but for me it was like very strange to see so young kids who had uh, so much life experience and who really like uh, put a lot of effort and, and really tried to to reach out to their parents and, and, and in the end they they are yeah they, this this was a struggle for them so it's it, it, it's i agree it's it's a story of of forgiving and, and also like a search for for someone who loves you <laughs> right. they are really searching for mothers Right. And they are really searching for parents, so it's it's a very strong story in that way that they are uh, that it, it's it's like children who who are 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 born without born without parents. <laughs> right, and yeah. Pete, Pete to, mm. let's close with you. I am Samuel. Yeah. So um, I'm thinking, especially from Samuel, like uh, rather than forgiveness, I think it's about masculinity, and especially. Mm -hmm with the father and son, like there's this, what is expected of a man and also about putting us in, in boxes, like this is how the community expects of you. So sometimes there is so much pressure, uh, leave alone just being gay, but even just being, uh, for example, a man in a patriarchal and uh, they're saying, if you're a man, this is how you should behave and these are the rules that you should play. So there was a conflict in the film because the father had expectations of what he wanted his son to be, uh, to marry a woman and get children. And he just wanted to be himself. He wanted to live his own life. And that was the conflict in the film, the expectations of what your father has of you and of you being yourself. And when do you give in and should you give in or should you just be yourself and try and be free and follow your own path? So that is the, the conflict, leave alone just being uh, gay. I think many men uh, have this conflict. The expectations of society are forcing you to be and what you want to be yourself. So that is what um, I think was central in the film. Well, I want to thank all of the filmmakers for, for being so open and generous and for the Santa Fe Independent Film Festival for, ho for hosting this panel. And, and Stephanie, to you. Uh, so 
that's I think Wonderful. I think there's nothing left to do but watch the films. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you so much for moderating, Lynn, and thank you to our films. You can see these four films October 14th through 18th, uh, 2020 through the Santa Fe Independent Film Festival's virtual festival. Thank you so much and we'll see you next time.